ex-cult members, what was your, oh crap, I'm in a cult moment, story one. Googled my cult's name for the first time, which I thought was just the name of the church, and saw many articles about how the leader was charged for assaulting women. I showed my fellow cult members, and they told me, the leader said, those are all articles lying, and we shouldn't believe them. I reflected some more and realized that weekday services at 4 a.m. and Sunday services that lasted seven hours were not normal. Story two. When I was stationed in Okinawa, late 90s, I went to this church that seemed to be the pretty generic Christian church, but they met in a small room above a store. Didn't think much about it until they got a new pastor. They owned a house in town and always invited everyone over for some cookouts and Bible study. The new pastor was actively encouraging the enlisted service members to move into the house and get the housing allowance to support the house. Then he wanted to see our LES, think pay stubs, to ensure we were supporting the church enough. I think the final straw was when they started taking attendance for their seven days of services. Yep, you were expected to attend some church thing seven days a week and trying to shame anyone that didn't make it to something. I didn't tell them I wasn't going anymore, I just stopped showing up. They knew where my barracks room was and sent soul savers get me back to church. The last they talked to me, they went again with the shame route that no other church would get me into heaven. I told them, I think they proved I made the right decision. We have a membership for those who like more naughty and interesting stories that aren't advertiser friendly. Check out the link in the description and join our amazing confessions community so you can support the channel. Story three, when the leader wanted to split up all the marriages and take the wives for himself, and when he wanted to give the husbands of those wives different women to be with, basically sharing the women except nobody had a say in who they were with, Many people were deeply unhappy and pained by this, but they had to submit to the Holy Spirit, as they would say, and do what they were told. I was a teen at the time my family and I left this cult, so thankfully I was not pawned off to some random guy. Story four. I was born into Scientology. Even though I internally questioned a lot when I was younger, I learned very early on to not actually question anything. My aha moment was when I was ready to go on to the next step and one of our other members, who not so surprisingly is also an ex-member now, asked me why I was planning on doing what I was doing. And my answer was, it's what's expected of me. I went home and really thought about what I wanted and I realized I didn't actually agree with most things in Scientology. I started the process to leave shortly after. I had to leave the right way since my dad and sister are still very involved and I don't want to lose them for my life. Edit. So I'll answer some questions here starting with what is the right way. Now, this all happened 15 years ago, so I'll do the best I can, but there's some info I just don't remember or remember incorrectly. So leaving the right way depends on where you are within Scientology. There is public who go in, donate, take courses, go to events, but are under no contractual obligation. Classify org staff, the place most public go to get their services done, and those on staff work there. It's more like glorified volunteerism. You are typically under either a two and a half year or a five year contract, and you're expected to work at least 40 hours a week. And when I was a senior in high school and told them I couldn't work all those hours, it was insane the amount of pressure I'd put on me to drop out of high school and go to work for them full time. And by full time, I mean Monday to Friday, nine to 10, and Saturday and Sunday, nine to six. And there would be events for the public on a lot of Saturday nights that would go past 11. I did not drop out of school, but it was a point of contention the entire time I was there. The Sea Org. This is the highest level of commitment within Scientology, and within it, there are more levels. But I don't know much about it since I never got in. I do know you have to sign a one billion year contract and you get housed and fed on their dime. But rooms are essentially closets with a bed and a dresser and no real personal space, and would sometimes make about 50 a week for working 80 plus hours. You didn't really get time off. If you were there, you were expected to be available for anything, since you really had no other obligations. So, how I left. As I stated above, I was on staff at a class of e-org. And when you do that, you don't pay for any services you get. So I had finished one of my services and was talking about what the next one I was going to do was. When one of the other staff members asked me why I was choosing the one I did, and essentially I had already started down one of these several different paths. So my answer was basically, it's what's expected of me. When I said that, he told me to go home and think about what I had said. I did think about it. And over the next few weeks, started opening my eyes to things that were happening that I didn't agree with. I realized I wasn't really happy. And this wasn't what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. So I decided I was done and was going to break my staff contract. I don't remember who I told, but they started the ball rolling right away. You need to have a leaving staff sec check. 
basically a super intense, very expensive exit interview that takes days or even weeks to complete. Once that's complete, you're supposed to essentially make amends with anyone you feel you have wronged by leaving. Then to get back in good standing, you have to pay your freeloader debt. So any of those services I told you were free while you were on staff, well, now that you're off of staff, you have to pay back the org for them. And it can be thousands of thousands of dollars. My dad paid for my SEC check because I said I wasn't spending any money on them. And he wanted me to be in good standing. I had some money saved up from when my mom had passed away and I used that to pay off my freeloader debt. Trust me, I wish I hadn't done that. But then after that, I essentially made sure to not say anything bad about Scientology around members I know are active. As far as my dad is concerned, I still think highly of Scientology, but it just isn't for me. I think my sister knows better, but we just don't talk about it. I've been out for just about 15 years at this point, and I still get mail, phone calls, and it's still awkward when I see Scientologists I used to be close with. But I am much happier now. I love my life that I've made for myself. Story 5. I grew up fundamentalist, evangelical Christian. My dad saw the Duggars on TV and decided we were going to be like them. Long skirts, modest clothes, courtships, all of it. My mom had gone through early menopause due to cancer treatment, but that was merely a small roadblock. I went to church every damn day. I was not allowed to question the doctrine. I was not allowed to study for the SATs because my mission in life, per God, was to get married and have babies. I was responsible for the impure thoughts my male counterparts had, and it was my job to dress in such a manner that they weren't tempted. I got my 17-year-old butt beat with the belt because I wore jeans. I was told that women shouldn't have a voice in their reproductive care because that's what God is for. So no banging until marriage and no birth control. Also, women who banged before the holy bonds of wedlock were compared to used scotch tape. I'm out now. I banged before marriage. My dad refers to my daughter as a bastard. We don't speak. I'm typing this out wearing a tank top and shorts. I hated my life in that cult, but I love it now. Story 6. South Korean Cult I attended, but thankfully didn't join in the end. I had just moved to Korea at 18 years old and didn't really know anyone. I was just starting to learn Korean, conversational but still low level, and didn't really have a lot of friends yet. Someone invited me to go to church with them and they were really nice and I wanted to meet people. I had a lot of fun at this church. The people would take me out to eat, help me with Korean, and even help me with my homework slash test prep. It was 100% the nicest church I've ever visited, and I felt like I had a place to fit in now. This is how they suck people in. Also, there was a female pastor who was hooper hot and would sometimes let people, always younger men, stay with her if they needed a place. I always wondered if this was an intentional tactic to lure in more young men, because this specific church, one location of many, seemed to only go after men. Eventually, they started pressuring me to make myself unhealthy, saying there was a balance between physical and spiritual strength. I love bodybuilding, so me being physically strong was an issue. They were pressuring me to lose muscle and try to make myself sick if possible to make my body as weak as possible. They said if I didn't, my soul would grow restless and crawl out of my mouth when I was asleep. I repeatedly said I wasn't interested, but wanted to continue attending this church. This wasn't acceptable at all, they strongly pressured me to start making myself sick. I stopped going to the church, and they waited outside of my school for me and followed me around for what seemed like a couple of months. They knew my class schedule and were always outside trying to talk to me. Eventually, in the end, they backed off, and I never heard from them again. Another guy from the church also got creeped out and left, and we're still good friends to this day. Story 7 I was raised LDS, which isn't a cult per se, but there's some strong cultish tendencies. There was a lot of stuff. I'll see if I can list it. I had a hard time with the discerning fact from fiction for a while when I was a kid because I was surrounded by adults who claimed to literally hear the voice of God speak to them when they prayed or attributed stuff like finding the keys you lost earlier that day in a location you definitely would have left them to the direct intervention of God in worldly affairs i.e. God is real. He's here on earth. He talks to me and helps me find stuff I misplaced. I participated in a baptism for the dead, where I was baptized in place of someone who died a while ago, whose name had been submitted to the temple by a family member, probably. For this, I changed into a white jumpsuit and was dunked under the water by an elder in my faith in a tub of lukewarm water, held elevated from the ground by 12 life-size gold-painted oxen statues. It was cool, though because afterwards, we went go-karting. I lost all the races, but it was still fun. I was told the end of days was right around the corner, 
and I needed to prep some food and stuff for when Jesus came. Because before Jesus came, the geopolitical situation had been prophesied to make it difficult to get food. So my mom had a bunch of instant potatoes in the basement for when Jesus came back. The shooting of a child predator, slash, emotional abuser, slash, arsonist, slash, murderer, slash, self-styled militia leader, was pitched to me as a tragic martyrdom. Good times. I've got some dank casserole recipes in the quiver for when winter rolls around again, and some of that God is with you and will help you succeed delusion, helped me start a pattern of academic success, which put me in a pretty decent career. Story 8, Mormon, LDS. One of the most important experiences is going to the temple. No one told me anything about what goes on there, so imagine my surprise when I found myself in an all-white room with a movie screen and an entire audience of church members dressed in white. The ritual itself involved watching a movie depicting the fall of Adam and Eve. The minute the Satan character appeared on screen, I just broke out giggling. All of these adults were mesmerized and taking this all very seriously. The ritual also included costume accessories, veils, sashes, hats, that the adults were told to put on at various points in the presentation, and secret handshakes. I left the temple knowing it was a cult. I've been heartsick about it ever since. All of it is Freemasonry dressed up as something else. If you've made it this far in the video, hit that subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. It helps the channel grow. Story 9. When parents and church leaders took me to the Mormon temple for the first time, and the first order of business was, I had to get naked, so some stranger could touch me near my privates and bless them. I was allowed to put a small drape on when walking around all the strangers in the room, but it was still horrifying when they first reached inside it and touched me. This ritual was a requirement for me to be a Mormon missionary. I tried telling mom and a few leaders that it made me uncomfortable without sounding like too big of a wuss, but their answer is straight out of most Mormon literature. Story 10. You need to keep going back until you understand it better. Apparently the fault was on me for not being spiritual enough. Today I'm an ex-Mormon because I decided that this, and a lot of other major problems with Mormonism, just wasn't right. Story 10. My primary school. The principal ran the school like he was in charge of everything. And he was, but I mean, in a different manner. Anyway, so when I was in prep, they always said, line up in lines, only hold the boys' hands. Pretty standard if you don't want to get lost, yeah? Well, if you tried to even hold a girl's hand if you were a girl, you get a punishment in the timeout corner. They also forced Christianity upon everyone had the library teacher come down and only read the Bible entries. You wouldn't learn anything but Jesus and God, along with English in this school, up until you hit grade four. So yeah, when I left, I literally felt so refreshed. Australian Catholic schools are weird as hell. They also made you attend liturgies that went through class time, even when it's the important part of the year where everyone's rushing to get work done. They also yell at you for not smiling. Edit. I forgot to mention, but they also hired a bunch of abusive teachers. They only recently fired them after I left. Uh, I hope they also fired the guy who touched his daughter's breast while she was asleep. Yeah, my school was generally screwed up. Forcing faith upon people is just simply not the way to do it. Like, even from a trying to convince someone's standpoint of anything, forcing it upon them just doesn't work. Really work. Sure, you might get a few, but a lot more will be turned away from it. It's always unfortunate, I think, when I hear about these sort of scenarios where it's forced on people because, hey, maybe without it being forced on them later in life, they would come to faith in their own ways or for their own fulfillment. But now they have this terrible experience they associate it with, and they don't want any part of it. And by the way, this is coming from someone who is an atheist. But I do absolutely see value in spirituality and faith of all kinds. It works for some, not for others. Story 11, this will be controversial. And I don't know if I'd describe it exactly as a cult, but at least within my specific upbringing, nobody thinks you can leave the faith. There are swaths of the world that believe leaving doesn't happen or even should lead to physical punishment and harassment like Scientology. You can even die. A lot of people believe you should die. I legitimately didn't even know you could leave it. The media around you is highly controlled. It praises converts to it, especially white, and even people from outside the faith group massively fetishize it, to the detriment of people who don't fit within its orthodoxies. Women have huge amounts of pressure on them to control their bodies. Purity culture is rife. Abstinence is taught at religious schools. And the craziest thing is, again, a lot of people who don't belong to it protect and fetishize it. A lot of its adherents, to be fair to them just don't know what their religious figures even did or believed. So often the people leaving it know the darker side of the generally well-packaged exterior that is presented by preachers earning millions and targeting particularly vulnerable people. Story 12. 
My brother-in-law joined the Mormon church years ago. He decided to go on a missions trip, and the restrictions on when he could talk to family made him realize it was more of a cult than he thought. I don't remember the specifics, but he was allotted minimal time for phone calls. All emails to us were monitored, and he couldn't come home for holidays. The whole ostracizing you from your family and friends was a red flag for him. He didn't leave right away, but he started using it for socialization and networking for employment. When he wasn't around Mormons, he drank alcohol and coffee and banged. I was around a lot of Mormons when we lived near him, and they made it very clear the purpose of their friendliness was to convert. They invited me to a class at the church that was free. A few weeks in, they messaged me to talk about God. I declined politely, and within a week, they no longer offered the class. They all stopped talking to me once they knew I wouldn't convert. Story 13. Not exactly what was asked, but a fascinating story. A friend of mine is adopted. For years, he was weighing the pros and cons of trying to find his birth family. One of the major cons was the expense. Anyway, one Christmas, his wife bought him a genetic testing kit. One of those things where you spend a hundred bucks and you find out what percentage of your genetic background traces back to where. It turns out when you do this, they also match you on their database to relatives. He found out he had a genetic cousin who'd also taken the test. He got in contact with the guy. The guy talked to his parents, and they were able to piece the story back together. My friend's parents are married to each other. Back when his bio mom got pregnant with him, she and her father were not married, and because my friend's bio dad was with the Jehovah's Witness, he could have been disfellowshipped for banging before marriage. So instead, she had the child quietly, gave him up for adoption. Then they got married and proceeded to have three more kids. So my friend suddenly found his bio family, including three full-blooded brothers that he might have never known about. We joke about how his parents did him a favor by giving him up instead of raising him in a cult. That being said, there are a lot of complicated emotions involved in that kind of situation. Story 14. Two months before my marriage to my wife, getting my endowments at the Mormon temple. I researched Mormonism when I joined the religion. I really wanted to believe in it, so I guess I just ignored the dodgy history. It was so fun being a member up until that point in the temple. I went to the temple with no knowledge. I didn't want to be cynical about it. It was the only thing I was open-minded about. I guess the temple never really was on my mind up until that point. After that, my shelf broke. Nothing was the same. It was like the illusion was gone and I could see all the bad stuff. My dad was visiting me that day. He had to wait outside, and I went in with my new family. That was the first sign of bad things to happen. As soon as the strange chanting happened, I knew I screwed up. I was madly in love like never before, and not going forward with Mormonism meant losing my fiancé. I was like a rabbit in headlights. I ended up just going through with the marriage. But ultimately, my marriage failed in the ninth month when I realized I had no power over my own life anymore. And I was in an abusive, controlling relationship, mostly from my wife's in-laws. My wife is still stuck in it. She's autistic and has no friends outside of it. And even though she knows it's a con, she also knows she has nothing else. My biggest regret is I should have done it better. Worked out a way to pull her out. I failed my wife and it pains me to this day. I miss her every day. I feel like that guy in Game of Thrones, Master Eamon. You know, what is honor without love, etc. Resigning from the church was a must. I had to stand up and protect LGBT people and the children whom have and are abused by the LDS church. At the same time, I do often wonder if I have thrown away happiness for the sake of honor and truth. I miss my wife every morning when I go to bed. It's a lonely life I lead, and I sleep better knowing I did the best I could. Screw cults. Story 15. I was young and needed friends in a new college. Church of Christ was very huggy and friendly, but suddenly I was pressured to give up all my secrets confidentially, and they would tell others, and when I asked why, it was, we just want to help you first or second time, maybe a mistake, but it was over and over. And I told them how messed up they were and left. Was very hurt by them. I was forced to say I was gay by one member and two friends were hurt too, but in different ways. They called me to vent for a while. Update. It was the Glendale location in California. They were in Pasadena City College. They did Bible talks and we were pressured to bring new people to them. A number of midweek church events, pressure to get married within. They did studies with new members, including a darkness study, where I was asked over and over again by one member if I struggled with homosexuality, until I confessed. One of their standard questions. He was supposed to keep it a secret, even per their rules, but told their main guy anyway, and he started acting strange around me, and I didn't know why at the time. Also, super focused on negativity. 
like the girl who told me I needed to smile more every time she saw me. If it didn't work the first time, I didn't need it 10 or 20 more times, Margaret. Story 16. If by cult you mean a religion that recruits with lies, retains with brainwashing, and demands devotion in the form of money, time, and proselyting. Then I started leaving my cult almost two decades ago. The Mormon religion has been described as a high-functioning cult because they're mainstream enough to have prominent celebrities, politicians, and a reputation for being good people. The religion started as an apocalyptic banging cult in the early 1800s and would have died out organically after its founder's death if it hadn't been for a perfect storm of polygamy. Hard to quit once you start pioneers. Hard to leave after you've isolated yourself thousands of miles from the rest of civilization and priesthood tears. Like Scientology, there's always a higher level of membership to achieve, accompanied by secret ritualistic temple ceremonies. I know of no definition of cult that the early Mormon church doesn't fit to a T. Perhaps a more relevant question is whether the modern Mormon church evolved from the original hardcore cult can still be called a cult, and only a first-order comparison between the recruitment and retention methods of the modern Mormon church and, say, any evangelical Protestant religion is needed to demonstrate that, indeed, the modern Mormon church remains a cult. Story 17 grew up in an Assemblies of God church. The pastors convinced all the parents that Pokemon was demonic and of the devil. This was back in the early 2000s. And all my classmates were playing the Game Boy games and with the trading cards. My schoolmates were all hosting Pokemon card parties at each other's houses. And my parents wouldn't let me watch the show, play the game, or go play cards. I just wanted so badly to fit in. I stole money from my family members and shoplifted so I could have cards and experience the awesomeness that is Pokemon. I hid a stash in my bedroom. My parents found it and shared how hurt and disappointed they were that I was playing a satanic game with the whole life group, church small groups that meet in homes. They guilted me into repenting and surrendering my Pokemon cards and Game Boys. They proceeded to organize a special bonfire where they burned my cards, Game Boys, and the cartridges of the games while everyone prayed over me to cleanse me of the devil. Basically, I had an exorcism for Pokemon. When I finally got to America for college at age 17, I got to play it in my first summer, told the story to my other friends, who helped me realize I was spiritually abused. Story 18. It's long, but if you want a serious answer, I have one. I was born into and spent my early years being raised in a cult. I didn't have any outside contact from the church family until I was six years old, and I was homeschooled for kindergarten. My home life was abusive, my father was in the military, and my mom was poor and uneducated. So we lived with her immediate family who were all church members. I had to start public school when I was six, which was hard for me to do because at no point did anyone ever explain to me the difference between my family's beliefs and the beliefs I encountered of everyone else. I was also bullied a lot for the way I spoke and the way I dressed, as I wasn't allowed to wear pants by my family's rules, so I always wore dresses. We were poor as well, so my dresses were always old and outdated. And ugly, I hated wearing them but this type of atmosphere continued for me into high school. I was punished at home when I fought against it. When I was 17, my dad arranged a relationship for me with a man who I moved in with. Not to go into explicit detail, but this relationship involved a lot of lack of consent. I grew sick, and when I was sick, he took me to a doctor. The doctor put me on a lot of psychiatric medication that made me very zombified, and I gained a lot of weight. I went from 120 pounds to 220 in a year. The guy I was with was disgusted with me, and he ended up moving back in with his parents, leaving me abandoned on the side of a road after vacating our apartment. I was 19 and had no idea what to do other than call my parents. They begrudgingly allowed me to come back home, but the atmosphere was still abusive, and I just felt like I had to leave. I ended up living in homeless shelters for about a year, and I was in and out of mental institutions for about two years straight. But the people that worked at the hospital set me up on government assistance programs while it was happening. The Obama years were good to people like me. I was able to get housing assistance with my own apartment. I didn't qualify to live in group homes because I was considered too naive to be able to handle it. No one else knew what to do with me other than to put me in my own apartment and give me a caseworker. She visited me twice a week and taught me basic life skills like how to shop and how to use a debit card. So I got food stamps and SSI and basically learned how to live a self-sufficient life. I was 21 when all of this was happening. Eventually, I was doing so well that my doctors let me come off my medications. It happened very slowly over time because I was on a lot of them. 
After about two years, I was medication free and I'd lost 100 pounds in the process. I was 22 and I decided I wanted to go to college. I was still seeing my caseworker once a week, but I started taking buses to classes at a community college for computer technology. I was pretty blank slate when I was choosing my major, but technology really fascinated me, so I wanted to learn more about it. Being educated in college was completely eye-opening for me from a scientific perspective, but I still struggled with feelings of allegiance to my old church. I'd always felt like it was just a church and that my family were just misunderstood people. So while I was at college, I still maintained close contact with a few church family members. We're hosting a refugee woman from South Sudan. She barely spoke English. Her family had all died back at her home and she had come to the States as part of a federal refugee program. She was also pregnant. We found out from a doctor's visit that the baby had not developed lungs and would be stillborn. He recommended an abortion. My church family had an intercessory prayer meeting over this event where they decided the woman would not have the abortion, but we would let her have the baby at home and then we would hold it as it died, which is exactly what we did. I watched that woman push that baby out in like 15 minutes and then we all held that little baby as it died. I was 23 and that was the moment I finally figured out I was in a cult. I had memories of doing similar things when I was a young child, but here it was now, in my face. I lost my mind a bit, but eventually I got it together, finished college, and cut off all contact with my family and my church family. I'm in my 30s now, and I'm actually doing quite well considering the start. I've worked with cult specialists and deep programmers to get to where I am now. I haven't spoken to any of my family or church family in almost nine years, and for the most part, they leave me alone. Story 19. I did a high school exchange in the States when I was 16, 17 from New Zealand. The town I was placed in was super small and close-knit and extremely traditional. I went to church with them, and honestly, the first service I attended, I expected a camera crew to jump out at any time. I was holding back laughter and had to leave the room because I found everything so ridiculous. As weeks went by, I realized it wasn't a joke. These people were serious. I would still have to leave the room, but not to laugh. Instead, to hide in the bathroom and cry. I had to attend the youth group classes also with my host sister, and the pastor was teaching this whole generation of kids such vile mindsets. He told them that blacks and gays are not to be tolerated, especially not in these walls, the church. He would teach them that God only serves them if they go to their church because they're the only ones that are worth God's time. He taught them that dinosaurs never existed, and the University of Tennessee planted the fossils around the world. The moon isn't real and is instead just a ball of light similar to the sun. They would stand up during services and cry, hold their small children above their heads, and the adults would scream. I have no idea what they would yell, but every time it was so passionate. My last day in the States, they pulled me up to the front and gave me a Bible. And they said, now we know for sure that God is able to serve even in other countries. As you go home, and he will be in your heart forever. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up and click the link in the description to join our community. You can check out this video on your screen in the meantime, and I will see you in the next one.